So my first experience with HTML was in 1993. Um, we, there was this thing called the internet, and I was building a BBS system, which for those of you who aren't that old, uh, was it you dial in with your computer, and it would talk to that one computer. And we were doing a real estate information system, and we needed local kind of stuff. And a friend of mine said, you should write an HTML, this in HTML. So I wrote an HTML browser that ran on a BBS which is yet another example of one of those places where I've been right there. <laughs> um, I met Dory uh, because we were early webloggers back before weblogger was a term, back when we were microportalists or something. Back when you could read every blog there was in one day. Yes. <laughs> um, and I have grad students call me up and say, Hey, you were one of those pioneers. Can you introduce me to one of the famous ones? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, my, my history is not a lot of uh, web development, I, or not a lot of high-level stuff. I wrote my first CGI in C back in 1994 or so, and I've been a bit pusher mostly since. You might have seen my name in credits to Pixar films and stuff like that. And my current gig is a huge departure from all that and it's very challenging because of that because I'm not used to dealing with people. <laughs> um, so, I called this why JavaScript sucks. <laughs> um, Dory and I have been having this conversation for years. <laughs> um, uh, I like it. Greenspun's 10th rule. Any sufficiently complicated C or Fortran program contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden, slow implementation of half of common Lisp. And if you look at JavaScript, it really is kind of scheme, which is a common Lisp implementation, with a C or Java-like syntax. Um, also, I loved this. This is JavaScript, the good parts. That's JavaScript, the definitive guide. <laughs> um, and so all of the reasons that JavaScript sucks, you all know this stuff. Um, most of my complaints actually come from things like why I, I start typing in Facebook or Twitter and it moves my cursor to somewhere else, or people who do three uh, input fields for um, phone numbers and then try to get the cursor movement right and don't. Um, but the bigger things here, uh, the testing and debugging are hard. And this was the thing that first sent me toward Node, was that I was looking at implementing some things uh, for friends, and they were moderately graphically complex, and there was no way for me to say from a command line, did I screw this up or not? Um, I had to fire up web browser, hit shift F5, hope that everything loaded. If it didn't, I then had to go load individual things, and it was just a royal pain in the ass. So that's what first kind of sent me down the node path. Um, why you should use JavaScript, because that's what sells. Um, everybody's using it. The big things that have blown my mind recently are that with ASM.js, everybody familiar with this? Anybody familiar with this? So this is a dialect of JavaScript that includes some ways to give the runtime engine typing hints. And there are, there's a, a compiler system for which one of the back ends is outputting to JavaScript. So you can write C++ and have it run in a JavaScript platform. And there are various game engines from the 90s knots which do this. And it turns out that ASM.js optimized engines are within an order of two of native C++ code, which is well within what the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, is. So, bang, JavaScript is suddenly a JVM that doesn't ask you to install the Ask toolbar. <laughs> as far as um, security uh, issues, it's deployed bloody everywhere. And... Security is scary. The browser folks know they're huge targets and seem to be getting it more right than the Java folks. And the last one is, you know, customers are attracted by blinky lights. All of those things that I hate about JavaScript apps, other people love. So get off my lawn. <laughs> so the big thing that sent me down the node path is that in a traditional uh, application architecture, Web apps are kind of their own client server-ish thing. But back in the late 80s or so, we settled on this model that was a model view or model controller and then views. So the model was the thing underlying everything. 
that had the business rules in it or had the rules for data integrity. And then the controller was the thing that said, oh, changes are happening here. We need to feed it out to all these views or feed it back in. It was a good way to have multiple people viewing one piece of data and update it. So this was the <coughs> dawn of the word processors that allowed split, split screens or two things on the same, or two views on the same document. Um, so yeah, view knows how to display stuff. The controller aggregates changes and distributes it to views. The model is the data store and the business rules. And so real enterprises often do the model in SQL. The Oracle uh, is all about yeah, it's an SQL database, but it's also about rules so that you can't make a debit to one account without making a credit to another account. Um, lots of integrity checks, and those integrity checks go into business rule things about, oh, you're trying to move too much money from this account to that account, or things like that fail. Or simple things like, hey, that's not a valid password, which I'll get into in a sec. So a few examples of things that might show up in business rules. Um, inventory control, you might want to say, as a system I'm currently working on does, we have a pool of devices, but once we allocate them to a user, we track that device individually. And so there's the whole notion of, if I insert a row into this table, I have to decrement something out of that pool. Um, double entry bookkeeping, I already said. Password policy is a big one. Uh, a lot of sites now whine and complain if your password doesn't contain at least one Cyrillic character or something else. <laughs> and uh, This is a difficult thing to enforce at the model end because you've also got to enforce it at the client end. You really want to tell the user right up front, hey, this isn't going to work, not have to hit submit. So I'll get to that. Uh, less silly examples are um, rental policies, discount conditions. Uh, introductory pricing on internet service providers. I currently work for Sonic.net. This is a royal pain in the tail. We have to check that you get this discount service on your account only as long as these other discount services are on your account. And when we're doing the sign-up code for that, we have to say, okay, these stack in all of these interesting ways, and inevitably that code diverges between the back end and the front end. And so we, you know, regularly hey, this said I was going to get this discount deal, and it doesn't happen. Why am I telling you all this stuff? Oh, sorry. I also haven't looked at these slides for about a month. No. Um, I did the presentation to some coworkers, so I'm a little out of, out of sequence here. Um, so the models. You will often hear people say that MySQL is not a database, MongoDB is not a bit database. Um, Excel is definitely not a database. The reason for this is that MySQL, to a large extent, MongoDB, to a lesser extent, can't really encapsulate all of the rules of a model. So what we end up with is a layer on top of that in some other language, in my case it's usually Perl, um, that has the business rules contained within it, and then that works to the database as a data store. <clears throat> so on a web app, a modern web app, uh, you start to get a lot of stuff in JavaScript on the client. So you kind of have a model and controller on the server. Um, in the case of the stuff we do at sonic.net, we have a database, we have an RPC server which contains all of the model rules, and then we have the web, web app which talks to the RPC server, and a bunch of other things might talk to that same RPC server, automated processes, things like that. And then we have the controller in the browser, and as you'll see in just a moment, that can actually have multiple views in the browser. In the real world, it looks kind of more like this. Everything goes to hell. Um, you start saying, oh, I can graph this on here rather than put stuff in the middle, and yeah, that's my life. Um, <laughs> so uh, I mentioned password constraints, and this is one of the first things that we're attacking at work, <clears throat> is if you have something like change a password script down there in the model. You've got multiple controllers, your CGI scripts or your PHP or whatever, talking to that. And you want to enforce your password has to be at least eight characters long and contain one letter and one number, blah, blah, blah. Um, so you put that down in your PHP, and then you put that up in your client code, and you're using different regular expressions for everything, and everything goes to hell. Um, 
So, uh, the other thing I mentioned test-driven development earlier, it's really nice to always say, I want to write some code that tests what I expect this function to do. And then as I make this function more complex, add additional features. If that original code breaks, I don't want to run into it. That's really hard to do in browser-based apps. <coughs> Enter Node.js. Um, it's a little standalone command line interpreter. Uh, hello world is as simple as console.log console hello world, something you've all done from a JavaScript in a web browser for debugging. One of the coolest things for somebody like me who hates the fact that there isn't really a good runtime environment except, well, you, nowadays you can hit F12, but before it was like, oh, my JavaScript isn't executing. I must have made a mistake. Um, so what you can do is you can work with it interactively. You can type things in, start typing a, uh, an object, hit tab a couple times, it'll tell you everything you can do with that object. That's pretty darn cool. Um, and uh, node, hello. Well, so console dot, and there's all the methods in that console, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, the thing that really is starting to catch my attention to that earlier password example is that because you have that command line interface, that means you can run it standalone. If you can run it standalone and share code between web browser apps and standalone things, then all of a sudden you can put that uh, password verification code or your business rules for whatever your model is in JavaScript and have it running the same code in both places. No more trying to figure out the difference between your regular expression stuff. Um, when somebody builds a, this is how your coupons stack, that's how your coupons stack, whether it's in the browser or the server. Obviously, you gotta think about that a little bit, but it starts to get really, really attractive. <clears throat> so here's how you might do that. Um, I didn't, had no idea what kind of an audience you were. So, and I'm the sort of person who has a uh, soldering iron on my desk. So, <laughs> um, this simply wraps the exports for something that doubles a number and uh, returns the exports data so that you can then, within your HTML, include it, call var.com and double it, and bang. There's your function. Um, you can also, from a command line or standalone script, do exactly the same thing. Um, and if you wanted to, say, call it from Perl, you could do something as naive and simple as, <clears throat> uh, wait, which one is it? Oh no, this is standalone. Uh, so this, uh, the, for those of you who aren't Unix heads, the hash bang at a beginning of a file says on Unix environments, execute this as input to that interpreter. So this all of a sudden becomes a script that you can use from the command line. So you can say this script and give it a name and it will find the first argument and run that script with the name. Which leads us to, there's the Perl. Um, <clears throat> so, this simply goes through and uh, calls, where we go? It quotes out, the, uh, quotes out the argument so that you don't end up with a shell injection attack. And then using the backtick operator says, put the output from this command into the result variable and print that out. And that's the first place where all of a sudden it's really easy to share the code between your model and your view. Um, so one of the things that modern languages have is a test framework, and uh, Node has something called, well, a couple of things. It's got JS hint, which is like a lint, for those of you who work in C. It's something that goes through and says, yeah, this is what you're saying the, the language says. Did you really mean that? Um, and you might want to try rewriting it in a different way. Often there are legal constructs that aren't what you meant. Um, I'm actually not sure. Does JavaScript 
do the um, if you do a, a single equals in a in an if statement, does it do assignment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you all probably run into the drop and equal yeah. sign, and all of a sudden things aren't doing what you want. Um, it has a framework called Mocha. Mocha is a command line app which looks for a directory called tests or tests, or you can override this, and runs everything in it. And if any of them return errors, um, it whines and complains. So it's really handy to say put this in a make file. Uh, so, any of you guys know what make files are? Okay, <laughs> um, so that you can say make deploy, and the first thing it does is runs the tests, and if the tests don't pass, it says, sorry, not going to deploy it. Um, so yeah, there's the, uh, there's a deploy from the make file that I actually used to develop this talk. <clears throat> and here's how you write tests for Mocha. Um, basically, you kind of tag things on to ex you can tag things on to existing classes, tag tests on, and set up asserts. So in this case, we're saying uh, if we call double it with two, we expect four. Uh, in the process of developing this, I also set it up to say what happens if you call it with a string of four, and made made it tweak that when I discovered that in fact that doesn't work as nicely in JavaScript as it does in Perl. Node has a Something that you Perl people, which I don't think there are any of, um, <clears throat> is a lot like a combination between CPAN and uh, Distzilla. It's the Node Package Manager. It lets you, the, the things here are the things that I learned the hard way as I went along. Dash G installs a package globally. Uh, most people like to do kind of the Ruby thing, which is where you bundle all of your external packages and requirements in with the local installation. Uh, NPM is really good at that. The other thing is that NPM sets up projects. It's kind of like Rails in that way, that it likes to set up and control your project. So often you will use NPM to start things because it will set up all your prerequisites. I can't talk, really. Um, <clears throat> so Node.js is all of those awesome things. It is also a server. Uh, at its very core, it likes the idea of because JavaScript functions are first-class objects and closures are easy, basically you do things like attach functions to ports. You say when stuff comes in this port, execute and do what you want. It is not threaded. There are some things that try to make it kind of threaded, um, but it is a very stateful machine. Some people think threads are great. Uh, I have I wrote the core of Grace Notes heavily uh, threaded CDDB or CDDB database, and I think threads are awful. And I <laughs> totally subscribe to Alan Cox, that's, who said a computer is a state machine. Threads are for people who can't program state machines. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about the architecture is that it, it because of first class function objects there's a lot of functionality layering. There's an, it is really, really easy to pull in something and say, here, do this HTTP server that calls back to me at all of these different locations. So a lot of the, the demo I'm gonna show you a little bit further on here is not so much its own package as an agglomeration of a whole lot of things in an integrated way that I haven't seen in the Perl universe. So, simple RPC servers. Um, the startup cost of waiting for that, or executing with backticks from Perl, that external thing is a royal pain in the tail. What happened if you had something that uh, just sat on a Unix pipe and let you connect, open that Unix pipe, send stuff and receive front stuff to it? That is the entire thing. So what you do is you open this file, write something to it, read something to it, and get back from that uh, JavaScript without waiting for the startup <coughs> cost of ex executing it. Simple HTTP server. Um, require the HTTP module. Uh, create a server. When the request comes in, write a 200 type text plane response and send out hello world. It's that simple. It gets a little bit more complex 
<laughs> if you start to wait, did I have two slides of that? Oh. HTML versus HTTP. Yeah. Oh, this is probably emerged from a bad a git awesome operation gone bad. Number, by the way. <laughs> what? It's an awesome port number, by the way. The, the last slide. Leak. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so uh, you'll notice that the first one sends out the same response for everything. Uh, this is what you have to do to start layering in routes. If a GET request comes in to the root of the web server, then respond this way. Um, and there are similar ways to layer on file servers so that you can say if something happens within this part of the tree, serve it as though it were a file, otherwise serve it up. As, uh, as code. <clears throat> so um, there's all sorts of really cool modules out there. Express is kind of the, the basic web server framework that everybody's using. AnyAuth is the largest number of NASCAR badge login I've ever seen. You know, the, normally you see Facebook, Twitter, maybe a few OpenID variants like Yahoo and Google. This sucker just goes on and on and on for pages. So if you're building third-party login into your app, I almost set up to just do that part in Node and uh, you know, then go back to whatever your favorite web development app is. Um, <clears throat> a couple of these are just things that I ran across. LiveDB is something that, well, both uh, ShareJS and LiveDB are integrated into Derby, which I will show you in a moment. <laughs> And they are good for things like allowing multiple people to edit the same document simultaneously and you see each other's changes, like you see when you use Google Docs. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Derby and Meteor, I'm about to talk about, I think. So in architecting web apps, you all are kind of, I heard, um, did I hear Ember earlier or Angular? Angular. Um, there's this notion of, uh, used to be this notion of, we will serve an entire HTML page, you will hit submit, we will serve you another entire HTML page. Then people said, well, that's silly, we will load just enough HTML to fire up a JavaScript environment, and then we will serve everything with JavaScript. And the problem with that was that you then had to wait for a couple hundred kilobytes of JavaScript to come down before you first saw your web page. So Twitter for a while was doing that. You had saw it, you could see it on sites which used the hash uh, convention for URLs. And then Twitter went back to a hybrid system where they load the HTML first, and then they load all the changes to that in JavaScript. That seems horrendously complex to those of us who are used to developing a language which aren't JavaScript. But what if your framework was smart enough to get around that? <clears throat> so. Let me see if I can remember this thing. CD, oh, quit out of that. Code, Node.js presentation, where was the directory? Uh, Derby.js, first project, npm, no. And um, F11. And, uh, okay, so my hope was that I could actually get a couple of browsers up here. This was a fool's errand, but we'll try it anyway. Uh, hey, you get to see all my porn surfing. <laughs> um, Thanks for that discussion. <laughs> okay. Oh, come on. <laughs> Narrow down, you silly thing. Oh, there we go. Um, come on. So there's a reason that I'm doing this this way. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so you'll notice that we have two views on the same document here. So here's some fun. One of these is in Firefox, one of these is in uh, Chrome, and I can type in one. And you can obviously scope that. These are both 
controls which are happening at a global scope, but you can say, you know, for this session or for this database record. Um, and the fact that that simply falls out of the framework just blew my mind. And then we get to, oops, F12, let me go back. Let me just copy this off. So, start another one. All right, now we're really pushing the limits of uh, what you can see on this tiny little screen. But, um, oh, the, so, okay, that's what I was trying to tell, tell people here. Uh, so here's the, um, we create a database model, we subscribe the messages to it, and we render home, and I really forget what this does anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so where's home.html? an app. Oh, maybe it's in server. No. Okay, one in doubt, go back to the command line. There we go. Views. Um, so, this is what the HTML template looks like, and I'm going to see if I can pull a web browser to the front, and another web browser to the front, and then go back over here carefully. Now I want you to watch something. I have just edited my HTML file. I'm about to save it. <laughs> um, yeah, it really is magical that it simply figures all of that stuff out. It's a, uh, I'm, I haven't yet done anything serious in it, but I'm, I, I, I want to find an excuse, definitely want to find an excuse to have somebody pay me to, to learn more about it. <clears throat> um, so uh, the two competing packages for doing this kind of stuff are Derby and Meteor. And I discovered Meteor first. It's worth going and watching the demo uh, videos from both of these because they're similarly like, whoa, I can just edit stuff and I don't have to hit Shift F5 and it all works. Um, the difference is roughly Meteor is GPL, uses its own package manager, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm a believer in not trying to fake threads on top of things. It uses a package called Fibers, which tries to thread fake, fake threads on top of things. Derby is a MIT license, uses NPM, and uses callbacks and state machines for everything. And has a little bit more support for JavaScript-less HTML. So if you're just using it as an HTML environment, it's a decent templating HTML environment that happens to automatically reload. Um, both of those frameworks are heavily under development. Uh, both of them are definitely pre-release. If you were trying to, if you're trying to just build a web server, I think Node is there. If you're trying to build an application that does all of this concurrent editing stuff, it's definitely pick a team and do your development in conjunction with that team. Uh, get on the mailing list, be a part of it, because these things are still evolving. It's not quite there yet. Um, but it looks really, really cool. And the idea that you can have the same code base from the model enforcing the business rules all the way up through running on your browser, just really, uh, if we can get this deployed in just little places, could revolutionize how we maintain code. And even just things like, if you start to think about pricing information, you know, just something like, oh yeah, did you up update the product page to say that this now costs 40 bucks rather than 39.95? Oh, there's another space I gotta go do it in. Um, pulling all of that from a simple template and in the same code base really sounds attractive. 
Um, the other thing that this gives you is a debugger. I haven't dug into it a whole heck of a lot, but it looked kind of like GDB, which is a command line debugger that us C users have long lived with. And uh, so I assume that you, there's probably an Emacs mode to use it because there's an Emacs mode to use everything. But, um, oh, let's do this. Um, NPM, I, I have done this once. <laughs> Dang it. Uh, I'll, I can try to get this running later if anybody wants a, a personal demo. <laughs> Basically, it gives you a full-on GUI debugger in your CGI app. So on your server side, you can set breakpoints, step, inspect variables, um, which is kind of nice for those of us who've ever done a write a log file, close a log file, try to recover state. Um, and finally, if you're a whiner like me, you'll ask, do I have to write in JavaScript? Um, the nice thing is that, no, in fact, you don't. Most of you probably know about CoffeeScript and ActionScript. Um, the thing that really blew my mind recently was uh, mscripten, which is Clang, or Clang is, the, uh, is an open source uh, compiler. <clears throat> and... Uh, or I forget the whole technology stack, but basically you can write C++, compile the JavaScript. There are people who are doing really cool things with physics engines um, that output were, were written in C, tested in C, output JavaScript bindings so that all of a sudden you can write physics engine stuff in JavaScript. It's really cool. And of course, as soon as you have C, you can use write in Python, you can use the Unreal Engine, add JavaScript just becomes another platform. And uh, there is Perenscript, which is a, takes this whole thing full circle and gives you a Lisp syntax for JavaScript. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it would be remiss to not mention the other technology we note, which is you uh, OS X users, mm -hmm. or OS X, what are you calling it nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> Mac OS. Um, Not Mac OS, that's one thing for sure. Um, there's a, a JSC JavaScript command line, which if you don't want to actually install Node for all of the things except the really cool server technologies, is there. Um, <clears throat> the two places I would suggest going are nodejs.org and derbyjs.org. And of course you can harass me, but if you put my name into Google, I, I am the first hit, so <laughs> still. Stack Exchange hasn't knocked me off yet. <laughs> Any questions? I'll add something. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, um, on the the list of alternative languages that you can write, another option that I just discovered through through Wimp, uh, I think it was Darren who shared this option. Something called Trace Tracer, and it's like Trace with a U R at the end. It's from Google, and the idea is that you can write uh, in JavaScript or ExmaScript 6, which is the next version of JavaScript that's coming down the pipe. Um, 7 is actually out there too, but Tracer will take ECMAScript 6 and back pile that, if you will, to ECMA 5, such that you can be writing modern code uh, using the modern conventions, um, but not have to worry about the lack of browser support. Um, and that's, I didn't even know that was a possibility, but once Darren shared that with the, the group, it, it makes a lot of sense to me because the language is going to evolve um, and ActionScript and CoffeeScript or TypeScript, whatever they are, like I don't think that they're not TypeScript. They will not keep up <laughs> the same way that the native language itself will. Uh, so Tracer, I would check that out. Cool. I was going to ask, uh, what version of Linux are you running? Uh, this is Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, I, Ubuntu, I was a Debian user, and my wife said, I'm sick of Windows, I want to run something that you don't swear at every time you manage it. <laughs> I said, have a CD, and she managed to install it herself, and so I switched. That's the magic of Ubuntu. <laughs> okay.
Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.